Hello and welcome to Cards Bridging Voices, the podcast of Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. My name is Caroline Löbrich and I am Program Manager for Democracy and Sustainable Development. Today we are discussing the rule of law challenges in Africa and the European neighborhood and how the EU should respond. Globally, we observe growing barriers to access to justice, rising manipulation of emergency powers, and increased pressure on civil society and independent media. And the current COVID-19 pandemic is likely to intensify such trends. How should governments, donors, and civil society respond to this crisis? What immediate and longer term steps should be taken to ensure justice institutions are protected in a post-COVID-19 world? These are just some of the questions that we discussed in our webinar, co-hosted by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the World Justice Project. Welcome to our webinar today on the Eastern Neighborhood and uh, Africa and Rule of Law Challenges, uh, jointly organized by the World Justice Project and by Konrad Adenauer Foundation. My name is Caroline Lübrich. I'm a program manager for democracy and sustainable development um, at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue here in Brussels for Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And we are a bridge builder between the EU and the Global South. And we do that by um, looking at the nexus between democracy and development, but also climate policy and foreign and security policy. At CAS, we believe that there is no sustainable development without stable democracy. And there is no stable democracy without the rule of law. Um, that's why we have four dedicated rule of law offices worldwide, uh, one in Africa, one in Southeast Europe, and then one in Asia and one in Latin America, who really support the um, accessible justice and um, accountability worldwide in the regions. But of course, we also all know that the rule of law is currently on decline in most world regions. And this is not only due to Corona. And this is why our debate today is very timely and we couldn't be happier um, to join up with the World Justice Project. Thank you for being our co-hosts. Um, we're very much looking to the, forward to the debate. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're very excited for the debate and I hand over to you, Ted. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Ted Picone, um, Chief Engagement Officer at the World Justice Project. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the poll questions are up on your screen, so please feel free to scroll through them and answer them. In the meantime, I will begin uh, saying a few words about the World Justice Project and the work that we do to um, promote and measure uh, rule of law around the world and the efforts we're taking to um, support rule of law practitioners and defenders um, around the world. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, give you some slides of a PowerPoint presentation which summarize our latest rule of law index. Um, this is work that we've been doing for almost a decade which tries to track and measure the quality of the rule of law um, and I will open that PowerPoint now. So our index comes out every year and this most recent version uh, came out in March um, and it is an effort to measure the rule of law based on eight factors. Um, and the first four factors up here on the screen, constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government and fundamental rights are really about steps, factors that try to constrain the power of government and ensure that um, individual rights are uh, at the forefront. Um, the second group, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice and criminal justice are really aspects of state obligations, state responsibility to deliver justice to its citizens. And informal justice is another factor that we um, poll people on, but we don't formally include in the, uh, in the index numbers. Each of these factors have sub factors, and this gives you a sense of the specificity of questions that are, that are posed uh, to those that we're interviewing. 
Um, and in our um, database, you can really look into each of these subfactors. Um, what the index does is it is a comparative view of 128 countries and jurisdictions. Um, and it involves two sources of data. One is um, household surveys. We've now reached over 130,000 households around the world. And uh, expert surveys, um, over 4,000 experts are um, reached for the purposes of this survey. And in, in all, it's over 500 variables. And we work on a sophisticated methodology to um, equalize and uh, present this data in ways that people can compare across countries and across time. And just to underscore a basic point about why this matters, you know, raw rule of law and not just economic development, but other aspects of, of development, that the correlation is quite clear on the two points I have here, rule of law and GDP per capita, strong correlation, Countries with higher rule of law have higher GDP. Um, and similarly on health, in this case, we're looking at infant mortality um, and it is uh, a striking uh, correlation between uh, rule of law and infant mortality. So let's look at the global insights from this last index. I'm also gonna be referring to data we collected over the last five years. Um, so to start with the positive picture, there's some improvements over last year's scores. And here's just a quick snapshot highlighting some of the um, countries that have performed uh, better in the last year. Um, you can look at a couple of examples in uh, Europe and Africa in particular, and I'll go into a little more detail on that. In the... Um, Picture here, these are the countries that are scored, uh, have the biggest improvement and decline in their rule of law score. Um, so you see a range, you know, a big jump for Ethiopia, 5.6%, uh, and a worrying decline in uh, other countries, Cameroon in particular, and Iran. This Scatter plot looks at both one year and five year trends in the rule of law. This is annual percentage change uh, in score for each country over the last year um, and over the last five years. And, and what to look at here is the bottom left corner is the largest grouping of countries in which 28 countries declined in the past year and declined in the past five years. So those are particularly negative trends. And if you look at the bottom right hand side, countries that improved for the past year, but have nonetheless had a steady decline over the past five years. And here we look at the breakdown over the eight factors. Um, and you can see the number of countries that are both improving and declining. Um, so on the positive side, if you look at regulatory enforcement, 64% um, of countries have improved over the last five years compared to 28% that have declined. Um, or civil justice, where 50% have improved in the last year, uh, while 40% of the countries have, have declined. Um, but what's really striking is this next slide in which the areas that have seen the most significant decline both in the last year and in the last five years. And in particular, we see um, constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, and fundamental rights, um, which have really um, taken a hit um, over these past several years. And in, in the majority of countries, particularly, look at that score for fundamental rights. So there's no question that we're um, being faced with a public health crisis at a time when the rule of law is in under significant stress. This map shows us over the past year um, declines in constraints on government powers. And if you look in the past year, very worrisome numbers from Poland and Hungary and Serbia and Bosnia. I don't think people will be surprised about that coming from Europe. 
Um, Egypt is, is also uh, of major concern on this front, as well as Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. And here is a closer focus on Europe. Um, and you have uh, a ranking of the countries within the European region and a spotlight on Poland and Hungary to give you a sense of the trends over the last five years and uh, which countries are and performing well and not so well. This map shows us more specifically in, in Eastern Europe, which we'll be talking about in the course of the day. Uh, Moldova has done, uh, made some improvements according to the expert and polling surveys um, and had the best uh, improvement in this grouping, whereas Bosnia uh, fell the most. And I'm sure we'll get to some of that in the conversation. We also wanted to look at Middle East and North Africa as, as a particular grouping. And here, you know, Iran and Lebanon and Algeria are, are of great concern while uh, Tunisia is eking along in a more positive direction. Now, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't cover every single country, but um, this gives you a sense of uh, performance there, improvements in uh, Mauritania, Angola, and DRC. I mentioned Ethiopia previously, as well as Madagascar, um, and then <coughs> concerns regarding uh, Cameroon, Guinea, Mozambique, Mali, and Zambia. All of this information is available on our website. Uh, we have produced a new interactive data portal that allows you to look at each of these countries in more detail. You can compare them to um, the global rank, the regional rank, an income group, um, and see how they perform on each of the sub-factors. Um, and it gives you a lot of opportunity to customize your research uh, and analysis. Um, we also have hard copies available. Uh, if anyone wants one, um, send us a note. And I think uh, we will leave it there at that and come back to the group. Jaya, are we ready to show the poll results? Yes. Um, so I just shared the poll results with everyone, but briefly to go over the results. <clears throat> About 48% of um, our attendees are working on government accountability including election separation of powers. 35% are working on corruption, fraud, and integrity. 46% on opening government. Um, the largest one was fundamental rights um, for which people are working on. And then 50% half working on access to fair and impartial justice. On the second question regarding what, gov what measures governments have taken during COVID-19, um, one third of our attendees said their government has used emergency powers to propose or approve controversial, controversial me measures unrelated to the fight against COVID-19. 23% have adopted or enforced rules that limit the press and protection of journalists. 27% have had local or federal security forces act in a violent or abusive means, or 21% have had the government infringe on the privacy rights of citizens, and 19% reported that the government has postponed or canceled elections outside the normal procedures. And for our last question, almost half of respondents said that institutional accountability, meaning enhancing transparency and improving anti-corruption efforts in judicial institutions, is the element they consider the most important in reforming and improving the justice sector. 35%, a little more than a third, said equal access to justice was the most important. And 17% said legal empowerment was the most important. Thank you everyone for voting. Um, we're gonna stop sharing the results on the screen, but we will post these results in the chat function. Thank you very much, Jaya. And I hope you'll uh, peruse those uh, results. We wanted to get a sense of what our audience is focused on and worried about um, to help inform the conversation that we will next have. I'm going to turn to our panelists from Moldova and Nigeria and start with Vladislav Grivincia, who is executive director of the Legal Resources Center in Moldova. Um, his primary areas of expertise are in justice reform, um, uh, reform of the Moldovan Prosecution Service, the judiciary, uh, civil procedures, criminal procedures, 
He's also worked on freedom of expression issues and handled strategic litigation before domestic and European courts. We will then turn to Kemi Okinyodo, um, Executive Director of Partners West Africa Nigeria, um, working on rule of law empowerment, particularly focused on security and governance issues in Nigeria and West Africa. Her latest work is uh, focused on police accountability and as well as security governance reform and election security management. Uh, we'll turn first to Vlad and ask him, you know, give us a sense of how the pandemic uh, is affecting your work in, in Moldova. Hello, uh, I'm Vlad Rebinci. I'm coming from Moldova. It's a small country between uh, Romania and Ukraine, and I'm leading a legal think tank called Legal Resources Center from Moldova, We're working on justice issues for more than a decade. And we have been uh, surprised that Moldova scored so well in the, in the rule of law index for this year, and perhaps there is an explanation for that. Uh, we had an oligarchic regime at power until June last year, and the government changed into a more promising one uh, last summer, but that government didn't last that long, and only five months. Perhaps this shift from November last year was not captured fully in, uh, uh, in the index, but this highlights one thing, that progress is highly unstable. Overall, coming back to COVID, and COVID added a new crisis to the existing democracy challenges in many countries from Eastern Europe. This crisis impacts our daily life, but it cannot suspend the democracy. Neither can put it at rest the rule of law and human rights. The truth is that the social networks have more influence on people than government. Human rights and transparency blended with uh, freedom of expression, genuine freedom of expression, uh, give much more sustainable solutions than uh, extreme measures often applied by the government. Otherwise, people will simply disregard the measures ordered by the government, and this will further erode the legitimacy of power. This will ultimately give severe, bring severe economic implications and many other negative consequences. The experience from my region confirms that we learn little from history or from brightest minds. A two-month emergency order was introduced in my country, Moldova, on 17th of March. As a result, 60% of businesses closed. It is estimated uh, that public revenues dropped by 60 to 70%. Without any reasoning, the parliament was not convoked for over a month, despite the critique of the opposition. The pro-Russian government from Moldova, uh, disregarding the parliament, engaged in intransparent negotiations with the Russian Federation for a 200 million euro loan. This loan provided for a scheme of putting on Moldova the private debts of Moldovan companies in Russian banks, which are much bigger than the size of the loan. The leadership of the Broadcasting Council, which is the council to ensure that the broadcasting regulations are in place and respected, called the journalists to stick to the official information on reporting about COVID crisis and stop operating with opinions of journalists in the news. The leadership of the more than 20 web pages were blocked by the intelligence service, allegedly for the reason that, the, uh, that they spread uh, false things, fake news about COVID. Uh, the time limitation for offering official public information of public interest was tripled from 15 to 45 days, making making it practically impossible to obtain official information about COVID. The officials were delivering press conferences every day, but that press conferences didn't allow journalists to put questions, leaving space for a lot of speculations. An exception uh, from the public acquisition system was introduced for COVID crisis procurements, making these transactions highly intransparent and uh, feeding the rumors that contracts are assigned based on political interests. In the meantime, the president used the crisis to increase his chances to be re-elected in the next elections to take place in November this year. At the same time, the courts and prosecution offices practically suspended their activity 
except for very urgent cases. A special procedure for dealing with complaints against decisions taken to combat COVID was instituted, which can be hardly called fair. It is true that the initiative of the government uh, to access the Russian loan was blocked by the Constitutional Court, but its judges report that they were subject to pressure and called the prosecution office to investigate it. The prosecutors are still silent. The web pages closed by the intelligence service of Moldova were not the most influential ones. It builds a highly dangerous precedence when the intelligence is blocking the web pages for an indefinite period of time without a clear justification and procedural safeguards against arbitrariness. I would like to come here uh, to the uh, recommendations we, we can deliver. Uh, COVID is not gone, for sure. We are certainly not at the beginning of the end. It's rather the end of the beginning, just. What can be done by the EU in the short term to preserve the rule of law and respect of human rights in Eastern Europe, at least, is first, to put strict conditionalities for financial assistance provided to the government. And these can be that the applied measures during the crisis are limited in time. And we all know that emergency measures often last much longer than the emergency itself. Second, is that measures are proportionate to the gravity of the crisis. Of course, the gravity of the crisis vary from one country to another, but there should be some logic between the measures taken and the threat and the public threat. The crisis cannot justify the limitations of the role of the parliament or of the opposition anyways. Any limitation of freedom of expression or information is hard to justify in times of crisis. As has highlighted before, social media compensate this deficit by speculations and this damages the democracy. Uh, the challenges in ensuring effective access to justice can be mitigated via using digital tools, which are more and more used daily by people. Use of personal data for combating the crisis should be strictly monitored by independent bodies to prevent abusive interference with private life. And we have seen this in many countries. Keep the issue of rule of law and human rights on high level political discussions with the governments and also support the civil society and independent media in playing their role of a watchdog. Of course, these recommendations were made to EU, but uh, these recommendations can be applied and are valid to a big extent to other, other big donors as well. What is clear for me at least is that the rhetoric health or democracy and human rights is unacceptable for me. We can have all of them at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlad. Um, that's quite a list of concerns and developments. Uh, it sounds like in Moldova, um, the environment has become really quite difficult for um, justice, uh, democracy, and human rights actors. And I appreciate the specificity of your, um, your, your report. And it gives us a lot of, um, a lot of challenges to think through. Uh, we're now going to turn south uh, to Nigeria and ask Kemi to uh, highlight concerns uh, from her country. Good afternoon. I'm going to look at the issue from three, um, three to four broad areas. The first would be the human rights implications of the government response um, to the COVID-19. Um, pandemic and how this has um, played out with the law enforcement and security agencies, then would look at the implication of this to the judiciary um, based on the directives given by the chief judge of the federation. And then lastly, would look at the effect of this on the girl child education and then um, linking that to women's participation in decision making um, process. So first, um, I think it was 29th of March that the directive for the initial lockdown was um, given by the president. And that was like a total lockdown. Focus states were, the, were Lagos, Ogun State, and the FCT. But however, other states um, took cue from this um, directive. And what we had was supposed to be a full lockdown and um, the law enforcement agency, particularly the police, in the lead of enforcing the directive of the president. Uh, what we found was a scenario where, and I think the um, index raised that on the um, 
arbitrary use of force by the law enforcement and security agencies in enforcing the directive of the president. So we saw not new, but always, not a new scenario. But I guess one of the things I should state is that the response to COVID-19 has amplified the weaknesses in our institutions and in our framework within the country. So we had um, issues of extrajudicial killings, um, I'll say uh, indiscriminate use of force by the security and law enforcement, by law enforcement agencies and some security agencies, which led to extrajudicial killings, um, pockets of ex extrajudicial killings across the country. We had scenarios of um, extortion by the security and law enforcement um, agencies. And um, if you permit me to say, if you widen the scope of that beyond the security and law enforcement agencies, we also saw an increase in sexual gender-based violence um, reports, complaints from members of the public. And if you link that to the response of the security and law enforcement agencies, because the, one of the directives from the IG um, laying on the directive from the president was that there should be no arrest except for serious, serious offenses and serious offenses are offenses that were not available. So we're talking about arrests could only be made um, in respect of homicide, um, terrorism and s s such um, crime. So, and there was also a limitation or a restriction on members of the public visiting the police station. So you had a scenario where if you were a victim of sexual gender-based violence, who do you report to? How do you access um, law enforcement response? That was a challenge. Then if you link it to the issue of restriction of movement and essential services, we had a scenario where um, civil society um, organizations that worked in that work responding to sexual gender based violence needed to lobby to get special passes to be accredited as essential service workers so that they could respond to challenges of um, sexual gender based violence based on complaints that were coming in. We also had a scenario where the National Human Rights Commission was not seen as an essential service um, agency. So we're left out of the government parameters or framework that even made up the presidential task force for, um, that was set in place to respond to the pandemic. Um, this left a big gap. And of course, the gap was seen as in the course of the implementation of the um, of directives by the president. Um, when the National Human Rights Commission released a report sometime, I think, um, April 15th, if I'm right, and they gave a breakdown of the number of complaints they had received. I think the first report the NHRC released, there was a statement made by the executive secretary of the NHRC that the numbers of um, citizens killed by the uh, by police or law enforcement and security agencies were more than the were more than the casualties from COVID-19. And I guess that got the um, government um, worried. And then we saw a response of incorporating um, directives on, on human rights violations in the routine, um, routine briefing to members of the public. But like I said, if it had been planned properly, the human rights angle ought to have been embedded from the beginning and it ought not to be reactive. It could have been proactive and properly structured. Secondly, um, post the lifting of the of relaxation or review of the restrictions, curfews uh, were put in, the, a curfew is in place and it's still in place, so, um, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m or 8 p.m. to 6 p.m., 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. So um, restricted movement within this period. And even before that, I think mobile courts were also put in place to arrest violators of the um, directives. What you had, again, for some of us within the community was like a joke, because then you ask, hum mobile courts are put in place, then what about the legal representation for the violators of the um 
of the directive or the or the rules who defends them um and there was a joke among some of my colleagues that said uh, somebody called um called uh, his lawyer saying, I've been arrested, I'm being taken to the police station, can you meet me there? And the lawyer was saying, I go there, can I also be arrested on my way there for violating the non, the restriction to movement? Also because law, legal aid services was not seen as an essential service. Um, so you, do you query the definition of essential service to limiting it to public health, whereas public health built on what? Public health rule of law at this point in time ought to cohabit. And when you get the definition wrong from the beginning, the strategy for implementing and responding to the issue would also be loop-sided. Um, then we looked at the, I'll look now briefly at the issue of um, girl-child education. And girl-child education, I mean, for most of us, we're familiar with the challenge of, um, educa of the educational system within the country, a weak educational system across the country. So let me first start from there. So we have students at home not accessing um, schools because the schools are off limit right now, based on the restrictions. And there is a, there is a government, uh, there is a directive that most schools should go virtual. And when you say most schools go virtual, the schools that are benefiting from this, they majorly are the private schools. The public schools are unable to benefit from this because the resources, the mechanisms are not there. So you have children across the country primary school, secondary school that are in limbo right now are not, are not benefiting, they are not going to school. Either virt virtual is not accessible to them. And then when you look at the, um, the process of even opening up the system, the possibility of opening up the system, and we look at social distancing, the question you ask for the public schools, how do you implement social distancing in public schools that have classrooms of about 50, 60 children? Are you, what is the plan of the government in addressing this? Not forgetting that the right to education is not a fundamental right, we say, it's, it's non-justiciable. However, it is integral because when we look at the root causes of um, violent extremism across the country and the insurgency in the Northeast, lack of education is one of the root causes that has been, uh, that has been identified. So how are we planning to address the issue of education post COVID in the country? There needs to be um, there needs to be a, a, a discussion around that and looking at what we have on ground and how can it be strengthened. Um, we recently completed an assessment of area council uh, two area councils in the FCT, and this assessment took place post the COVID. And looking at the reports, there are challenges. We noticed gaps with hygiene. So some of the schools do not have running water. And then we also link that to the issue of preventive measures. So if we say, wash your hands on the clean running water for about 20 minutes, where is the running water coming from, number one? Number two is you then ask the running water in the schools, is it made available in the communities where these children are coming from? So do they even have clean water to drink at home before we start talking about running water to wash their hands in school. There just seems to be a mismatch, you know, in what the response ought to be and the reality of what we find on ground and the um, rest and the directives or the um, um, recommendation, so to say, on how to handle this pandemic. And then, I, I mean, my school of thought is that the non-justiciable rights can be linked to the fundamental rights. So when the non-justiciable rights are lacking, then the fundamental rights will definitely be, um, be eroded. So definitely we're looking at the right to life um, not being protected because health 
hygiene, education are a challenge. Um, finally, um, when we look, if we link this to the girl-child education, because we look at issues relating to women and girls within P1, that's our priority area. We know that some of the girls in some communities have, been, have used the school as an excuse to delay early marriage. But then we have a scenario where you do not know when the schools are going to open up. Are we going to see a scenario where the girl child is going to be married off before the system opens up? What mechanism is being put in place to protect these children, to protect these girls from early marriage? Um, Nothing really um, is, I, I don't think much discussion is taking place around this. Then finally, um, when the presidential tax force was set up, clearly missing, clearly missing on that committee was the Ministry of Women Affairs. And you ask yourself, why was the Ministry of Women Affairs sidelined from this committee? And I would I dare to say same as the National Human Rights Commission, because the government has refused to see the value that the ministry brings on the table. Same with um, National Human Rights Commission, that they are cross-cutting government agencies that allows you to see things from the beginning to the end through a particular technical lens and allows you to analyze and um, um, scenario building and come up with situations and responses that could come up when they are around the table and addressing and raising some of the fundamental issues. Um, final, on the courts, um, fine, my final comment on the courts is that the, the CJ, as I said, had directed that the courts should go virtual. It's a, um, for us in P1, it's a welcome development because since 2016, we've been monitoring um, courts across the country, picking them uh, in samples. And one of the things that have constantly come up in our report was the, was the need for the courts to adopt technology. So now you find that the requirement to adopt technology is being foisted upon the courts right now. And the question you ask is, are the courts ready and capable to adapt technology? Because it goes beyond Zoom court sittings. We are talking about the filing system. We're talking about the um, filing system. We're talking about the, um, um, the litigation, the entire litigation prism. Even, file, even making your payments online and getting it acknowledged. So it's from the beginning to the end. The, the situation that takes place in the courtroom is like at the end of the chain. What takes place before the courtroom and ends in, in the courtroom is just, is, is, is being left out. Um, we had a scenario in-house when we had a discussion, I think some weeks, um, some days back, that we had CJ signing up on this. And we were having some of the um, support staff in the courts pushing back on this. And they push back, it's just because they do not have the capacity to engage in this new dispensation. And of course, when you, are, um, when you feel a bit threatened, the best thing for you to do is to shut it down at your own level. And because the level of accountability is weak, nobody is going to be held responsible. So our recommendation would be, let's dust some of the implementations or some of the projects that have, been, that have taken place over time that were aimed at strengthening our judicial system our court processes and see if this is not the time to push for the implementation of some of this recommendation because the system is obviously everybody's vulnerable right now you have to be seen to be responding to it and you have to be seen to be having the interest of the citizens at heart next to that will be the um 
the vulnerable population and for vulnerable population for us, when you talk legal empowerment and you talk legal education, then of course, naturally the basic education system comes into it. And the girl child is very key and critical to this. Do not forget that it's the girl child that later on becomes the mother. And um, uh, research carried out some, some time ago when I was at, um, in my previous life at Clean Foundation, it showed that the level of influence that the mothers of the children of young people that joined Boko Haram had on their children was high. But it was a level of influence that people were not, uh, you know, we didn't pay attention to initially. So if that level of influence is high on the future generation, then it makes sense to invest in that, in this population and ensure that they are well positioned to take their rightful place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kemi, for that comprehensive uh, assessment and analysis. It's really, for both speakers, a reminder that um, we're going from bad to worse on many categories of the rule of law. And uh, that's what the pandemic is, is bringing to us. The system's under great stress. Um, I think your, your point about technology is also well taken, that there might be an opportunity here to move courts and the legal services industry toward a um, more virtual arrangement, if that can enhance access to justice, that might be a good thing, but you do have to think about all the people who don't have access to technology. Um, and your point about vulnerable populations is uh, very well taken. Let's turn now to our um, second round of panelists um, to give us a bit of a donor perspective. I'm going to turn first to Jonathan von Mierbeek, um, who is a program officer with the European Commission's Development Cooperation Agency, focused on gender equality, human rights, and democratic governance. Um, he's also spent many years working on European policy toward Africa, um, and previous to that as a migration expert. Um, I will then turn to Andrew Solomon, who is a senior rule of law advisor with the US Agency for International Development and their Center of Excellence on Democracy, Rights and Governance. Um, Andrew has a tremendous amount of expertise on different issues on uh, justice systems, access to justice, security uh, sector reform, as well as transitional justice. Um, so we'll turn first to, to Jonathan and I think he has a PowerPoint presentation. And for people um, who are um, listening, please uh, feel free to continue to add your questions in the Q&A box and try to identify the specific panelists um, because we will get to your questions after these presentations. Thanks a lot, Ted. I will share my screen. I hope you can. Yes. Uh, since I was told I had only 10 minutes, I thought maybe I may want to share also a few, a few links to some relevant documents on our side because there is a lot that we could say, of course, on, on what we do on, uh, on rule of law. Um, first of all, I will talk maybe about what we do to support rule of law, and then we we'll go into the, the COVID response. Huh? First of all, why is it that we work on rule of law? I mean, I must say it is actually a legal obligation on our side. Huh? It is one of the core fundamental values of the EU, together with democracy and human rights. And we have actually uh, an obligation to, it's also an objective under our external cooperation. Huh? So we have an obligation to work on it under the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU Treaty as well. And, and, and fairly so, because as you mentioned, I remember your, your graph that you presented at the beginning about the, the correlation between rule of law and, and health and, and development. Huh? For us, it's, it's very clear that rule of law underpins all that. So in the, it underpins all the other SDGs. So if we start, well, if we work on that, then it will allow us then to, to, to move ahead on all other, other development objectives. Um, what is it, so the, the, in which framework do we operate, sorry? Uh, I invite you, if you are interested, to look at our last proposal uh, that we published in March for the next action plan on human rights and democracy, which is our policy framework for the next five years. Uh, an interesting feature is that we propose now for decisions among the EU decisions to be taken at qualified majority voting and not anymore, and, um, sorry, uh, unanimously. Uh, so hopefully it will also improve and it will make it more smooth as well for us to operate in that field because we won't need unanimity anymore from all the member states. Um, in terms of our policy framework, it's of course, it depends on the, on the regions. 
uh, we have a very strong, uh, as you can imagine, dialogue with the enlargement countries, uh, countries who are willing to join the EU with a very strong leverage because if they have to abide by, uh, by our standards if they want to join the EU. So there, of course, we invest heavily on those countries and we also invest a lot on the, the so-called neighborhood countries. Uh, which are countries with, I mean, with most of them, we usually have uh, specific agreements, association agreements uh, that encompass, of course, trades, uh, developments, I mean, significant funding. We have rule of law operations and programs in pretty much all of those countries, most of them. Uh, it is a, a major priority for, for us. So you have the, I mean, Northern Africa, Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, mainly uh, Balkan countries that are all part of this neighborhood policy. Um, including those countries willing to join the to join the EU. For Africa, we have uh, the so-called Cotonou Agreement with African Caribbean and Pacific. So we have also a framework there uh, with also clear provisions on rule of law. For instance, the obligation, for instance, to join the International Criminal Court is in there as well. Um, it is now being renegotiated for for the next period. There will be a summit in October with African countries for for the Africa pillar of it uh, as part of the Africa strategy. Here also you can look at the priorities uh, in the communication we just adopted um, in March. And, and these, uh, these policy frameworks allow us for a political dialogue, of course, uh, at parallel level with each and every of those countries. And it's in that framework that we also operate, sorry, uh, how do I get there? Here we are, in terms of our cooperation. What is probably, I think, the most relevant uh, tool for us really is uh, the conditionality of our support. Uh, so there is actually a contractual obligation to respect fundamental values. That means that if there is a breach uh, of rule of law, I mean, a serious breach of fundamental values, I mean, human rights, democracy, rule of law, we are entitled to suspend our cooperation. We have uh, what we call the risk management framework where we assess uh, human rights, democracy, rule of law. So we use the indicators the, from the World Justice Project, uh, the index, and from others as well. Uh, we, we do a thorough analysis every time we need to make a payment to a country uh, to look at uh, to look at that. And it gives us then it's a, an extremely useful tool whenever we have a policy dialogue with the partner countries, in particular in those countries where the support is significant. Of course, in countries where our support is not that significant, then you can see that that's of course we don't have the same leverage. Obviously, if I take Moldova for instance, as an example, right, because we've been talking about but it's uh, there, for instance, we've had exchange of letters where we have uh, requested some, some goals to be attained for our next payment. In terms of reforms for the judiciary, we ask for a, a strategy to reform the judiciary. We've been also asking uh, to review uh, rules on nominations. I uh, just wanted to make sure that I'm not getting it wrong. Uh, sorry, for the members of the Superior, Superior Council of Magistracy. We have also requested some anti-corruption rules, for instance, to, to set up this joint investigation team on this bank fraud from 2014. Uh, also on media, Vladislav uh, uh, was mentioning that uh, we have also requested an audit of the Audiovisual Council. Uh, so you see, we, we make those payments dependent on some, uh, some strong conditions. And we have also incentives, uh, in particular in the neighborhoods, uh, for those countries that are performing well, uh, so to receive additional funding. Then uh, we have the, the cooperation projects on governance per se and rule of law. We've had it in about 70 countries, bilateral programs uh, over the past seven years. Um, there, of course, we justice obviously is, 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 is at the core of it, uh, justice reforms. Uh, we look at, of course, the independent, strong and efficient independent justice systems. We look also very much on the receiving end of it. So it has to be, of course, centered to, to the, on the people, uh, very important for us. Um, but it's also usually very often part of a wider program on governance huh? that includes also um, democracy, human rights, uh, stability, uh, support to a security sector reform, for instance. So, so it's not, on, not always only specifically targeted on the, on the judiciary. We, we like it to be also part of a, of a, wider, of a, of a wider program if, if it can be the case. Uh, and whenever we have, whenever we can actually work well with the government uh, or not, there is always very often uh, cooperation with civil society yeah? because we think that civil society actors are extremely important uh, in that process. Also, oversight uh, bodies, from thinking of Supreme uh, Courts, uh, parliaments, and so on and so forth. I mean, when we talk about rule of law, of course, you look much beyond the judiciary per se. Um, there was an example that I mentioned there, you can look at it as well for, for Nigeria if you want, where, where we saw there was a political will to work on corruption. 
and, and we decided to set up a 25 million euros program with the government, uh, with several strengths. Uh, we work with the judiciary on reforming uh, the criminal system. We look in particular at victim, uh, the most vulnerable people, for instance, victims of sexual uh, violence. There is also a component working with anti-corruption agencies, another component also working with, uh, with NGOs and civil society as well. Uh, then there is, of course, of cooperation at multilateral level, extremely important for us. So we support all the mechanisms at the UN level, the ICC, we support uh, the regional mechanisms, I'm thinking of the African Commission on Human Rights, African Court on Human Rights. We work a lot with the Council of Europe and the USCE, very useful, of course, in, in the neighborhoods. Uh, countries. And then I just want to mention as well, we have, of course, a, a different approach uh, depending on the level of the country, of development of the country. So, of course, in post-conflict context, in fragile countries, it is slightly different. It's part of an approach on traditional justice, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is, of course, adapted to the needs of the country, uh, including criminal justice, fight against impunity, uh, but, of course, reconstruction and so on and so forth. If you're interested, you can look, it is uh, publicly available, the evaluation of our past support in the neighborhoods. I think probably the main lesson learned is, is political will uh, and ownership. Uh, I mean, you can, you, we can invest a lot of money, for instance, into uh, a new case management system. If, if there is reluctance uh, from judici judiciary, it will not work. Huh? Uh, so you have, that's something we've, we've seen clearly. I mean, in, in that field of, of operation, you need, uh, there is a lot of reluctance uh, from the judiciary, from the, from the executive. Uh, so you need to have uh, very strong political will from the, from the highest level if you really want to achieve any meaningful change. In terms of COVID response, uh, like most of the donors, of course, we first attend at the health and humanitarian crisis, the socioeconomic consequences of it as well. We have uh, developed a big package of, of funds, uh, emergency response. Uh, we were talking about uh, we were talking about uh, about that and budget support, macro financial assistance as well. Um, and there, uh, you can see, of course, you can sense then the, the difficulty when we talk about that, because if I take again the example of Moldova, for instance, it's a country that uh, asked us to front load payments uh, to face the, the crisis. On the other hand, we tell them, and they also tell us, look, uh, we need to, so we cannot implement all those reforms that you ask us for because of the situation. So on our side, we said, look, you need to move ahead with your reforms. But on the other hand, there will be a new macro financial assistance package of 100 million euros. So you can see here, it's about the, the lesser evil. It's, it's okay, do we need on the one hand to attend the humanitarian crisis. The, 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 the government needs this money. So, 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 so how, how, um, how, do we, how do we then see the, the continuity parts of, uh, of it, conditionality and, and on rule of law? We want, we want to be strict on it or not. Uh, so it's, so it's an ongoing, of course, as you can imagine, dialogue at, with, with, at a very high level with those governments uh, and also, of course, internally uh, to assess how we go about, about this. We monitor the situation. Uh, I like very much that slide from Videma. Well, I <laughs> like it. It's, it shows at least those countries that are most at risk of, of democratic backsliding. Uh, so we look very much at uh, of the data and the, the trackers produced by, by VDEM, by an, an INCL, uh, the Economic Intelligence Units, Transparency International, World Justice Project. So we, we follow the situation very closely. We are extremely worried. Uh, I can tell you, you heard some, I think the, the, the examples from Moldova and, and Nigeria were extremely compelling. We really think, I mean, the question really is, okay, so when will this emergency measures end? Uh, that's something we, we are, we will be, we are monitoring very closely together with other donors as well. Of course, we meet with our member states every week, virtually to discuss. We meet with OECD donors, other donors. Uh, we have discussions with World Bank, IMF. Um, so all this is ongoing. Uh, and, and there is, of course, a lot of, of worries, in particular because when I look at your initial presentation, we see that it's in those fields where we see clearly a backslide in you know, fundamental freedoms, uh, right to privacy, uh, rights to assembly. Um, it's also looking, of course, at constraints on government powers, uh, corruption as well. We will see the highest risks. So we have a number of measures that we will be adopting. So we, of course, have recommendations from all our delegations all, in all the countries we work with, uh, we have a number of recommendations for them. On corruption, we have clear mitigating measures. So whenever there is EU funding involved in terms of transparency, in terms of audits, uh, whenever there is emergency procurement. So that is something that, that we are looking very closely at. We have, of course, the public diplomacy. Uh, 
the political dialogue with uh, with the government. We have specific mechanisms to support human rights defenders, individuals. We have also simplified procedures to to contract quickly with with NGOs. Uh, also, we are now discussing, for instance, a contract to support media, for instance, uh, in, in in several countries. We look specifically at vulnerable groups uh, in new actions that we are trying to to fast track. If I give an example, the Spotlight Initiative, you may have heard of, which is a a uh, flagship initiative of the EU together with the UN to fight violence against women and girls. Uh, and here we are, uh, we have an additional 9 million euros, for instance, for 44 uh, women organizations in Africa to keep doing their work uh, that they do in, in, in those countries. Um, then finally, in terms of response, when I look uh, forward looking, of course, looking at the, the situation after the crisis, we know it will be a very different world. Uh, the situation, of course, there will be much more fragility uh, in this country. So that means we need to adapt our thinking because we are now currently in the programming phase of the EU funds for 2021-2028. Uh, so all delegations in the countries are consulting with the government, with civil society, they are preparing our priorities. First, it's very clear that we need to prioritize good governance, rule of law, whenever we can. So whenever, whenever uh, it is possible, whenever we see that there is an openness to work on those. Uh, there was this whole discussion on triggering political commitments, uh, the stick and the carrots, uh, uh, so the conditionalities, the incentives, uh, the political dialogue, uh, we use all our tools we to be able to uh, to, we need to attain our objectives. In terms of approach, very important, of course, to have a very good tactic of the situation, to have a very holistic approach centered on the people. We have the so-called rights-based approach that we, uh, that we develop in all our projects. Uh, reach beyond institutions, as I mentioned, very important. So we will keep working with civil society. Uh, we have a dedicated instrument for that, uh, and that will continue beyond, of course, uh, the approval of the of the state, and that will certainly continue. So, in short, that's that's the main point I want to make, and I'm happy to answer to any questions you may have. Thank you. I was just saying, Jonathan, thank you for that very comprehensive approach. It's interesting to see the tension between the short-term urgency of responding to immediate needs and the longer-term challenges, and the way conditionality. Um, has to play into that conversation. Um, it'll be important to elaborate a little bit more as we um, go on with the conversation. Um, but let's turn to Andrew to get a perspective from Washington and USAID. Andrew. Uh, thanks, Ted. Just a quick radio check that you can hear me okay. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, one quick point uh, regarding the index I'd like to start with. Many of us at USAID, myself included, rely upon the index in the design and the implementation of rule of law programs in a, in a variety of countries. So I, I really just wanted to affirm that the index and, and the other data and analytical resources that WJP uh, and, and other uh, actors are providing is really essential uh, for how we do this work and frankly, uh, to help us do it better. Uh, by making it more data driven. Uh, so yes, it's a very, it's a valuable resource uh, for donors, uh, as well as the governments, the justice sector institutions, and I also believe uh, civil society, uh, which uh, in addition to doing oversight and evaluating performance can really drive innovation with some of the, uh, the data that you're generating. Um, I'll dispense with some of my preliminary remarks. Uh, they've been covered by others, but you know, I do want to uh, outline what we see at, at USAID uh, in our efforts to promote the rule of law in regions around the world, including in, in Africa and, and Europe. And in these regions, uh, what we see, as we do across the globe, it, uh, is a variety of rule of law problem sets. Uh, and these problem sets include, you know, first, a, a significant justice gap with millions, if not billions of people who are estranged from the law. They can't use it in their daily lives to resolve that legal problem, you know, often in civil uh, and uh, administrative matters, and we have the data on that. Uh, second, we see crime, violence, and insecurity still plaguing many countries and communities. And this is accompanied by that prevailing sense of impunity, no accountability for perpetrators, no justice for the victims. 
Uh, third, and this has sort of come out as well in some of the other presentations, judicial independence and self-government governance remain a, a, a real work in progress. Uh, and, uh, you know, additional efforts are needed to strengthen the powers of the judiciary, you know, to support a genuine system of checks and balances and to provide that uh, horizontal accountability that's so fundamental to rule of law and, and good governance. And then fourth, the last problem set is it's related to public trust and confidence in both justice and security institutions, which remains low in many countries. And we have lots of uh, data on that. And the reasons are, are many, but this lack of trust tends to stem from the inability of these institutions to meet the needs of the citizens and the communities that they're mandated uh, to serve. You know, unfortunately, many uh, uh, justice systems and security uh, systems are just not performing. So uh, in recent years, USAID's rule of law activities have largely been oriented around solving these problem sets uh, and the related issues. And as I think we all now know, we've established that COVID-19 is a game changer. Uh, it has exacerbated these existing rule of law problem sets, as we've heard uh, my fellow panelists describe. And, and at the same time, it's also giving rise to a new terrain of challenges that we're really trying to understand uh, and begin thinking through how to respond. So uh, like other actors in the space, uh, USAID you know, quickly recognized that COVID uh, is not just a, a global health crisis, uh, but it, 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 it also has you know, economic, social, uh, and, and political uh, dimension. And it, it, it's definitely uh, presenting a, a crisis of rule of law uh, and justice. So in early April, uh, my office, the, the Center for Democracy, Rights, and Governance uh, in Washington developed a white paper uh, to inform USAID strategies and programming for COVID-19 uh, response. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if we can uh, share that in the, uh, the chat box, but it is available on the, the USAID website. You can Google it. But with regards to the specific rule of law and justice response activities, uh, this, this white paper addresses in, in no particular order. And again, reflecting what we uh, have been uh, addressing today. You know, first, uh, really, the need to ensure the legality of and prevent the abuse of public emergency powers, the lockdowns, the curfews, you know, with regards to protecting fundamental rights and, and freedoms, as well as judicial independence. And I, I think Kemi uh, began to, you know, get into that issue. Uh, second, uh, we see the need to mitigate the disruption of court operations and legal services on account of the physical distancing requirements. So that brings in the, the digital or the remote hearings. Uh, but there's other uh, creative and innovative uh, ways uh, that have been uh, uh, experimented with uh, or otherwise used uh, as part of their existing systems. So this, we're also looking at uh, the need to protect the health and the safety of those deprived of their liberty, um, those in detention. You know, and I haven't heard too much about that, but that is indeed uh, a, a significant implication by COVID uh, and the need to release um, uh, nonviolent offenders uh, who are in detention facilities, not just out of concern for their own health and safety and their fundamental rights, but out of you know, concern for the personnel uh, uh, within uh, current facilities. Uh, and likewise, we need to be concerned about the health of all frontline justice providers. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, we're really stressing the need to address those immediate COVID-19 related legal and justice needs of individuals and communities, particularly those of, of, of women, uh, the poor, and other uh, key populations. And here, it's the domestic violence, it's the discrimination and stigma, the denial of access to services, including health services uh, and evictions uh, and housing issues. Now, in terms of some of our uh, actual 
uh, assistance programs and activities, uh, what we call the COVID pivot, and how our uh, uh, programs and our partners uh, are moving from their longstanding work uh, objectives uh, to uh, address uh, COVID specific. Uh, it, it takes a variety of forms, and I'll just highlight briefly some of the, the examples of how uh, our partners uh, with USAID support are, are making that pivot uh, in, in both Africa and, um, and Europe, and I'll start with Africa. Uh, in Liberia, we see, we're uh, supporting the National Bar Association there, uh, who is now providing pro bono legal aid through their legal aid uh, centers to decongest the uh, detention facilities uh, in order to prevent the spread of the virus. So legal aid uh, lawyers are actually working uh, to have uh, pretrial detainees accused of nonviolent crimes uh, released on, uh, by court order. Uh, in uh, Morocco, uh, on, the, on the security side, uh, we're working with police commanders uh, in providing you know, uh, safety trainings so that they can brief uh, line officers on public health protocols and good practices for how they interact with the public uh, and how they should, uh, where necessary, uh, make arrests uh, and investigate uh, crime scenes. You know, with regards not only to the rights uh, of citizens and individuals, but also, you know, with, with regard to um, uh, uh, just good practice uh, with health. Uh, in Rwanda, uh, through our program there on access to justice, civil society organizations are developing the public service announcements, uh, producing radio talk shows as a way of disseminating information to the public during this time. Uh, particularly with regards to how to, to, to avail themselves of newly established uh, telephone hotlines uh, to access legal advice while they're on quarantine, and on other means to contact paralegals with uh, complaints um, during the lockdown. And a lot of this effort is also being directed uh, to uh, those in detention, whereas before social distancing, um, uh, our programs were actually able to physically uh, engage uh, and go to detention centers, but now that's a, a big challenge uh, uh, with uh, lack of access. So how do we reach these populations uh, with um, the concerns of um, physical distancing? And then in Ethiopia, we're working with the Supreme Court there on the technology side to conduct uh, remote hearings and video uh, conferencing. So we're, we're building that uh, that infrastructure uh, for them to continue up op operations. Uh, in Europe and Eurasia, uh, specifically in Georgia, we're uh, working with the High Council of Justice there. They've convened a working group like we see in other countries, uh, that, but it's the High Council of Justice really driving a working group uh, that involves the Ministry of Justice, prosecutors, the bar, you know, to begin elaborating what are the procedures uh, and the standards for digital hearings uh, and also electronic case filings. And at the same time, we're supporting civil society organizations on, on the sort of side of the, the equation um, and uh, so that they're able to quickly mobilize and monitor uh, the work uh, of the courts uh, in this, uh, this new mode, this uh, electronic mode. Uh, in Kosovo, uh, the, Co the Kosovo Judicial Council actually drafted an, an emergency preparedness plan uh, to guide its decisions and the work during this COVID. Uh, it's, it's a plan which uh, was not really there. Uh, an emergency preparedness and, and response plan had not been in place. Uh, but now, uh, you know, one is, is being developed, not just for this one, but it'll serve them in the future should uh, uh, other emergencies arise. And at the same time, uh, we're having to work at the, uh, at the court level uh, and the court action plans uh, to actually begin foreseeing how to deal with the, the future backlogs resulting from the limitations of hearings during the pandemic. So, you know, reducing court back, well, backlogs is, is a challenge for judiciaries in so many countries around the world in, in just sort of normal non-COVID times. But, you know, now we're seeing with the reduction of court operations, 
um, there's likely going to be a considerable backlog that's going to have to be uh, addressed. Uh, and then just uh, in Moldova, uh, there the court automation and the infrastructure investments that uh, donors have made have really enabled the courts to continue uh, operations with regard to hearing uh, hearings on detention related issues and, and other civil cases that can't be suspended. And on this point, you know, we talk a lot about resiliency in the world of development. And I think this is, you know, an example where the investments that are made in court automation, uh, and while expensive and complicated, uh, and, and, and where they begin to actually take root, you know, we see that courts or justice institutions have this resiliency uh, to deal with these shocks. Um, so that, I think that's a, that's a positive. And, and similarly, in Ukraine, we're working there with the National School of Judges. They've shifted to a virtual platform uh, to really uh, address uh, or help judges you know, understand their role uh, in a pandemic. Uh, they're looking at techniques for successful online dispute resolution and also addressing basic wellness and mindfulness of, the, of, of court personnel and other frontline justice providers. So I'll, I'll just wrap up uh, with a few thoughts about more long-term post-COVID-19 reforms. I think as others have mentioned, the vi virus has really in many ways been a stress test uh, for justice systems and, and institutions around the world. And what it has revealed, uh, as I've heard one practitioner on one of these uh, you know, uh, large uh, global events uh, say, is that COVID-19 is a 21st century global pandemic colliding with a largely 19th century justice uh, system. Uh, and that what we see in many countries, not all, but in many, justice systems and judiciaries around the world. They're still very much paper-based. Um, there's other procedural and administrative processes and, uh, that create inefficiencies. Uh, and many uh, of these institutions are conservative. They're highly formalistic, legalistic, and resistant to change and innovation. But you know, as that proverb goes, necessity is often the mother of invention. And we have seen and we've heard today how COVID-19, the lockdowns, the social distancing has really forced some fundamental change in a, a matter of weeks. And in some cases, in a matter of days, uh, particularly in court operations and legal services. So I really think the question for us as reformers, as, as donors, as practitioners, is you know, do we return to the old methods, to the old normal, or or, or, or are we going to create a new normal, one that sustains and, and builds upon the recent innovations uh, in order to fundamentally transform justice? Uh, and I know there's been a lot of effort here recently about people-centered justice. Uh, I think that's a part of it. But to answer that question, I, I think we do need to invest in the monitoring and the valuation of these new approaches, the new procedures and the new practices where they have been introduced and are being used. You know, are they really working? Are they serving the interests of justice? Uh, you know, are uh, in virtual trials, is it virtual justice? Because is there a lack of defense uh, representation uh, and are the due process uh, safeguards there weakened? You know, but you know, so, and if they are working, and if they are successful, then how do we begin taking them to scale and to make them sustainable? I think that's the fundamental challenge uh, that we face. And then just very briefly, a couple quick other points. We also need to plan, and I think we're trying to do that, for the future justice tra tra terrain. Uh, we need to anticipate the legal problems that will arise over the long term. You know, not only how do we bring the public emergencies to an end, um, you know, following principles of legality? You know, but what will be the, the, the legal problems that are there? Uh, you know, employment issues, consumer debt, uh, bankruptcy, uh, you know, that, the, the economic uh, shock uh, to individuals and, and to, um, to uh, the private sector is, is significant. And related, I mean, the massive 
spending that states are making to keep their economies functioning and to deal with those immediate shocks from COVID uh, on the social uh, and economic side. I, I, I'm concerned that this could lead to a decrease in judicial budgets and funding uh, over the long term. Uh, so I think, again, as reformers, we're going to really have to make the case for why the judiciary, why the justice system, you know, why respecting fundamental rights are essential to the recovery and addressing the social and the economic implications of this pandemic. And again, I bring it back to the data uh, that uh, WJP and others are, are generating. I think the data is in many ways the key for how we make this case. So uh, I'll just leave it there. I look forward to your questions. Great, great. Thank you, Andrew and Jonathan, for those uh, comprehensive presentations addressing both the short and the medium and the long-term challenges that are posed by this pandemic. Um, also comes to mind the cliche about in every crisis is an opportunity, and this may be an opportunity to um, generate the political will and expose the underlying root causes of so many of these justice problems and the interrelationship, the point Kemi made between the fundamental you know, um, issues of right to education and public health and right to life and how these things have to be joined up in a much more uh, fundamental way. Um, let's turn to um, uh, our Q&A portion. We don't have that much time, we have about 10 minutes. Um, but turn to Carolyn to see if she's had a chance to um, uh, identify a few questions for the panelists. Yes, definitely. Well, first of all, let me thank everyone who, who submitted questions. We actually have quite a few and we hope to answer as many of them as possible. Um, but if your uh, question is not answered today, please don't hesitate to reach out, out to us after. Uh, we try our best. Um, there were actually quite a few questions that were uh, wondering about how the, the rule of law is, is adapted in um, EU programming, for example. So I'm going to go to you, Jonathan, and ask you two questions, pretty much. So um, the first question would be, uh, how does the EU integrate freedom, freedom of expression and the right to information in its rule of law program and emergency assistance funding? And the second question would be, um, I'm just you know, putting out both um, so that um, we can combine, uh, you can combine them in your answer. The second question would be, um, how is SDG 16.3, so uh, you know, the right to promote the rule of law and the national, at the national and international level, um, how has it been um, used in both EU internal thinking and uh, rule of law programming? And at the same time, how has it been used in, um, in the um, EU exchanges with African governments? Thanks a lot, Caroline. For, for those interested, I, I shared a few links also by answering to the question in writing as well, so you can look at that. Uh, on freedom of expression and, and access to information, it is obviously a growing concern. Uh, I think now we have we are taking it extremely seriously. Uh, the extraction service in particular of the EU also now is a dedicated team working on, on that. And in terms of, of cooperation as well, we've seen a growing number of projects and programs targeting specifically the issue of, uh, of media, for instance. We have get guidelines that date back to 2014. I send you the link uh, there, but I think they're still extremely valid. Uh, and, and we very much see, in particular now we see it with the COVID situation that, uh, that it is uh, in particular because we see also a shaking space for, for civil society to operate as well. Uh, so it's something that we systematically address in our political dialogue with governments. We have uh, dialogues on human rights with all our partner governments and something that we systematically share there. And of course, also through our direct support uh, to, to civil society, which is of course not always appreciated by the government, but something that we, we do anyhow. Uh, to your second question on, on SDG 16.3, I think you, you were mentioning how it has maybe changed the way we, we see things. I think what has been very telling, uh, and there you, you, if you look at the work of the Justice uh, for All Task Force, uh, is that actually we now realize that we will not reach <laughs> that goal if we just do business as usual. Um, because very often the justice, formal justice systems are not designed, and, and I see also the comment and from the, the colleague from Nigeria, uh, Ibrahim, as well, on the um, 
and they need to work also with informal justice systems as well. I mean, basically, people don't trust very often the formal justice system, so it's not adapted as well. Um, so, so, so we are, so we are, we realize now that we need we need more innovative ways of of addressing the justice needs of the people beyond the more traditional uh, support to the to the to the justice institutions. I would say. Uh, so there is now creative some creative thinking that is ongoing on, on how we reflect that then in a, in our programming for the next uh, phase on how we can expand concretely the support to the people with this people-centered approach, which I think now is, is also something that we learned from the SG16.3. On the internal EU uh, issues and affairs, uh, I think it's, it's a slightly different story. I think it's more, we look more at how, how the situation is evolving in some countries, what ways that we have and how we are reacting to that, uh, looking more at our own uh, the EU treaty, at the EU charts of fundamental rights, the role of the European Court of Justice. So I would say that here we have uh, much more specific, uh, let's say, um, I mean, I mean, regulations that we have to abide to, and and and, and fundamental rules that we that we that we are looking into, and, and concerns that is more, let's say, to turn towards the internal to the EU, uh, with mechanisms in place that we are activating as well. So it's a somehow different story, I would say. Yes, we had a, we had quite a few people actually who were wondering about the role of civil society, and I'm going to put that out to um, to the panel. Uh, maybe Kemi, we start with you because um, people are asking. Um, what can civil society do right now? What can civil society do um, to respond to COVID-19 and hold governments accountable for public health failings when their civil rights and their political rights are curtailed at the moment? Um, I think engagement of, for civil society organizations can come both ways. And um, I usually define them demand supply side. So demand side is the side where usually we're very used to which is the issue of um, monitoring documentation of um, violations or lapses or gaps on the part of government and um, documenting this, putting this in the public space, holding dialogues in order to hold them accountable. But then my school of thought is to what aim and purpose, what's the end objective of that um, um, engagement. So you look at the other side, which is the supply side. Could it be that the what we see as um, violations are a, as a result of systemic failures and challenges and gaps on the inside um, um, trail? If we are able to work with government to do an assessment of the system and identify where the gaps are on the inside trail and work with them in closing those gaps and strengthening the framework. And then also have a periodic review mechanism of seeing how effective that new system being put in place is working. Of course, we're still working with colleagues that have the mandate and the strength to monitor and document. Um, then you look at the policy environment. Do we need a review or a retweak of our policy environment? Then you have actions that can be taken at that level, either the policy or the legal framework. Um, for example, I mean, I can speak to us here in Nigeria. It's, um, I'm looking at our police, our policing reform process. Um, in, in this age and time, we've been on the review of the police bill since 2004, if I'm correct. The bill, the Nigerian Police Force um, re Reform Bill has been at the National Assembly since 2004. In 2020, it's more imperative now than before that we review the legal framework that the police operate with and ensure that it's strengthened, it's fit for purpose, and also the accountability process, looking at the accountability mechanisms. So it's not to jettison it, you know, and at the heart of that is one of the, I mean, um, Andrew raised this. There was a decision and it was a policy decision of decongesting the correctional services cell. Is that going to be an ongoing um, process or was it a one-off thing? What was the criteria that was used in determining who and who were released? You know, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure it's so clear. And also looking at the corruption and the manipulation that takes place, that we're aware that takes place in identifying um, detainees that make their way onto the list. 
before the pandemic. So now with the pandemic in place, who's looking at that? It's not just for us to be satisfied with 230 people um, uh, released from prison. Who were the 230? Were they those that had already been convicted? Because our challenge is not with those that have already been convicted serving time. Our challenge is with pretrial detainees. They form like the 60% of the population in the prisons. So is it that population that is being targeted? So I'll say that, I mean, there's enough work for us to do if we look at it critically and see where we can engage and where we have the strength to engage. And allow me to extend the, the question to Vlad as well, because I think um, it might be a similar picture in Moldova. Uh, first, I don't think that uh, the, the methods of uh, operation of NGOs uh, change over crisis. On the contrary, we should intensify our efforts, monitoring and reporting on uh, human rights violations is one thing. What we also discovered is that in the times of crisis, as Ted rightly mentioned, there are also plenty of opportunities to improve the system. And we've uh, noticed that lately, due to the fact that the resources of the governments are directed towards other directions, there is some openness of the government for technical assistance as well uh, in the field of uh, putting in place a better legislation uh, for respecting human rights and independence of judiciary. Great, thank you. Maybe one last question, uh, because we're already running out of time, but we have so many uh, interesting inputs. Um, I am putting it to, to both of the donors, so Andrew and, and Jonathan. Um, a lot of people have asked, um, on the one hand, how the EU has, um, has really changed its, its approach um, in responding to, to COVID and, um, and the rule of law uh, failings that happen in a lot of countries. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of people have stressed that there is a lack of accountability from political leaders. So the question, I guess, to both of you is, um, how can donors work with um, governments um, in this crisis and has the approach um, somehow um, been adapted to the crisis? Well, Andrew, if you want me to, to start, happy to do so. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, we are still uh, we are still now reacting, yeah. So we are still in a phase where we are we are, as I was mentioning, reacting now to the to the most pressing needs. Um, but it it is very clear. I mean, we're entering. It's actually it's just a coincidence, but it's also now a phase where we are uh, developing our strategies for the next next seven years. You huh? know, in our cooperation in a given country. So we 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 have we we have. We are currently engaging with the government anyhow on priorities for cooperation, and that gives us uh, leverage, of course, the leverage that we have from development aid. That is one thing. Of course, we have more leverage in terms of, uh, of political, political and police dialogue with, with many of those countries with whom we have trade relationship as well. Um, so, so, so we have, of course, uh, in, in each and every, I mean, our ambassadors also who, who are discussing with, uh, with the government. And, uh, and if I take an example, because here we have a colleague also from, uh, from Ethiopia, for instance, in a country where we've been investing a lot with many other donors on, uh, on elections, for instance, that are being postponed, well, then we need, of course, to, to, do, to analyze uh, how, how, how it impacts uh, our work with the, our support of the government on, uh, on the whole electoral process and on the democracy as a whole, of course, it is, and it has an impact on the way we cooperate with the government. Um, but it's something that we need to, to reassess in each and every individual uh, program, let's say, and uh, in cooperation with the government and with the donors, uh, I would say, on the spot, see how we, how we best adapt our, our cooperation. We may have to suspend some cooperation. We may have to, to, to threaten to suspend maybe sometimes. Uh, so there will be also this, this game that we'll be playing of, uh, of thing. It's, it's, it's part of it. Uh, what is very important in any case is to engage. Uh, in many countries, we have the ambassadors, all the EU ambassadors, for instance, meeting together, uh, you know, making statements, um, reaching out to the to the government to raise uh, to raise concerns. Uh, and of course, then it's not the EU. We are talking about the EU as an institution, the Commission anymore, but we are talking about the EU, including the member states. Uh, and then, of course, it becomes something. 
because you have Germany, you have France, you have all the most prominent member states as well, uh, with many interests in those countries uh, and vice versa, uh, joining in as well. And of course, when we are together on this, including other donors as well, of course, it certainly makes a difference. Uh, I would just add very briefly uh, that I think in order to uh, beat the pandemic, uh, to address uh, both the immediate needs in terms of response and then build to recovery, it is going to take uh, partnerships. Uh, and whether it's at the bilateral level, and we, we are uh, constantly you know, engaging in those dialogues, uh, government to government, USAID mission to counterparts uh, in the country. Uh, so those bilateral partnerships are, are key. It's the multilateral partnership. So just as we heard Jonathan say, you know, the donor uh, coordination uh, is going to be essential. Uh, it always is, but this is an even more pronounced. And then partnerships between the donors, the host governments, civil society, and then also private sector is another one that we haven't really talked about. Uh, so I would just answer it that way. Uh, is that we have to keep in mind, we beat this through the partnerships and they have to be multidimensional. Great, well, I think uh, it just leaves it to me to finish and wrap up our program. Um, first of all, thank you all to, for joining us. We had over 130 people from all over the world um, be part of this conversation. And it really um, shows technology can bring us all together in some new and important ways and we can learn from each other. I learned a great deal from all of our speakers. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you to our panelists for taking the time to prepare the remarks. Um, I think this is just a start of a conversation. As Vlad said, this is the, the end of the beginning. There is a huge long road ahead of us um, and there's uh, a incredible challenges in front of us in terms of governance and justice. Um, and this will help identify the priorities matching together what's happening on the ground in the field with the donor strategies and making sure they're all talking to each other. Um, so I hope we played a part in that conversation. We will have this recording available on our website in a couple of days. So we'll circulate it to everyone who registered and please circulate it beyond that to your peers and colleagues, and we will also be producing additional material on how the rule of law uh, space is being affected by the pandemic. And we hope you'll keep in touch with us and, and register for our um, updates uh, online. And I think with that, I'm going to sign off and thank you all again. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thanks a lot, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for updates on our work. You can find the links in the description. We are looking forward to seeing you again at our next podcast episode.